the basic thing before one of these is a large mug of tea. Yeah, I agree. Well, so we can mug, start. That's it, my mug of tea. There's my mug of tea. <laughs> right, well, if you're all sitting comfortably, then I'll begin. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to this morning's webinar through the British Main Chamber of Commerce. I'm Neil McGregor, the chairman of the chamber. And today is our first webinar after lockdown has been imposed in England, with other measures being imposed in other parts of the UK. Here in Bucharest, we are still relatively free, but as to how long that continues is anyone's guess. So we have challenging times. And what I would say is that it's something that anyone in business needs to be very inventive and resilient to get through this particular period. We are particularly pleased this morning to have Chris Alcock and John Dennis, together with our old friend Constantin Stan, giving this morning's presentation. A few items of housekeeping. Uh, we have a chat box in the bottom of your screen. And at the moment, I'm just pasting in the link to the page in the Chamber's website where you can find our speakers' biographies. So do please have a look there. Uh, we have 22 people online here, but our experience has been that most people take part in these events with a much bigger audience on Facebook Live, but also on Facebook Live. If you have questions, you're using Zoom, please put your questions in the chat box and those will be monitored. And if you have questions and you're watching on Facebook Live, please put your questions there and our team will monitor those also and pass those through because our speakers won't immediately see those. We are recording this event, so there's for GDPR compliance. And Again, one of the good things about this particular uh, pandemic and the Chamber's activities, we have, we have had some face-to-face -face events over the summer, but we're now back to full online and I can see we're covering the country. I can see Niku, who I know is definitely not in Bucharest. Um, we have people, I think, also in the UK looking in as well. So we really are reaching all parts of Romania and the UK in our audience for these events. So that's enough of me. Let me hand you across to John and Chris to introduce themselves. Uh, we are live on Facebook now. So again, if you have questions on Facebook, please do get those on the Facebook chat and those will be monitored and put to our speakers. Chris, John, Constantin, welcome. We look forward to hearing this morning's presentation from you, which I think could not come at a more appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. It's nice to hear some, uh, some calming, reassuring words in these times of uncertainty. So uh, this morning, uh, yeah, my name's Chris Alcock. I, uh, I work with organisations to help them uh, build their problem-solving capabilities. Uh, there's many different ways for organisations to do that, and two of those ways, and you'll come across those words a little bit later this morning, are Lean and Six Sigma, and uh, we have with us today a specialist, a coach, a trainer, a, a very widely recognized mentor in Lean Six Sigma, John Dennis. And John is also the chairman of the International Lean Six Sigma Institute. So what we wanted to do this morning was to, uh, uh, we're going to let John give us his ideas on how to deal with a world full of VUCA, volatility. Well, I'll let John tell you what VUCA is. Uh, there's lots of uh, lots of uncertainty around in the world at the present time, and uh, certainly that uncertainty is hitting hitting the businesses we work with and we work within. So for that reason, we wanted to put this morning's webinar together, get on board now or drown. And uh, what I'd like to do is uh, hand the uh, hand the bat on, to use a sporting analogy, over to John. John, could you? Uh, Introduce, uh, tell us about your ideas about dealing with the world with lots of VUCA and why we should get on board now or... Yes, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Neil, for that uh, introduction. Um, yes, extremely challenging times that we're living in. <clears throat> and um, as uh, an organization, 
um, ILSSI has uh, brought together some of the top um, minds and uh, practitioners in uh, a subject called Lean Enigma. We put it together as Lean Six Sigma. Um, we wanted to uh, present something today which was um, specifically about challenges that we face, try to recognize the challenge that all businesses have, and try to provide some answers, a framework for getting out of some of these problems and um, helping our businesses survive. <clears throat> so I, I just uh, want to make sure that you can Um, so it's, it can be, seem quite dramatic, but we, we purposely tried to make it dramatic uh, to wake up businesses to, um, to act. So as Chris said, um, oh, sorry. There you go. Um, we're living in this time of... Um, VUCA, I think. VUCA, yeah. So I just want to... So, Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. It's an acronym that, uh, you know, is being used quite a lot at the moment. And th these, these challenges are creating really a storm condition, a perfect storm condition, where the conditions for business are very difficult. Um, the economy is contracting. So the news today said uh, Bank of England's latest uh, predictions, forecasts are uh, minus 10% growth in, in 2021, approximately. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so we have a complex uh, volatile environment, which is the storm. We also have the water level, which is keeping our businesses afloat, which is actually going down. Okay. So, so what we, you're trying to say, John, is it's like the amount of business that's out there, the amount of commercial activity that's out there. It's like <laughs> a water level. Exactly. It's like the um, height of the sea. And you're saying that because business activity is reducing, it's yeah. like the, the level of the water sinking, the tides going out. Exactly. A contracting economy for the next few years. Yeah, it's it's go the the level of the water that's keeping our boats afloat is going down. Okay. Um. We're all in this storm together. But each business is like a different boat. We all have to look at our own boats and see: Are we fit for purpose? Are we fit for purpose for surviving this storm? Are we fit for purpose for a shrinking economy, less business to go around, less customers, more competition? Are we just Both? talking about yeah. commercial organizations here, John? You know, are we just talking about retail companies or, you know, are we broadening the, uh, the, the scope of, this, uh, of, of these ideas? Chris, good question. Um, this applies to uh, businesses and organizations across all industries. It applies to manufacturing, it applies to services, uh, services such as hospitals, services such as banks, insurance companies. Um, it applies to retail, commercial, supply chain, logistics. Um, so all businesses are facing this challenge of VUCA, of a decreasing uh, economy, okay. um, uh, increased competition. So, um, the, the graphic there is trying to show if you want to stay afloat, if you want to be a boat at the top, then you have to make sure your business is ready, is fit for purpose, it's got the right understanding of its customers. So, your customers are, 
are going to be changing their preferences, changing their buying habits, changing their what is what is important to them, changing their priorities. Have you done a an exercise recently to reassess uh, your customers' needs and wants? Was that direct or inversely, John? Uh, <laughs> what do we well, call that in uh, Lean Six Sigma? Uh, Understanding your customers' needs and wants. Anybody? Yeah. I think you know, li listening to the customer, listening to the what, what the I, I'm, I'm certainly, I've recognised that because a lot we haven't we need to spend a lot of our time, shall we say, isolated, you know, working from home. It's much harder to kind of stay in touch with the, the voices and the needs of our customers. So I think that's an extremely valid point. The voice of the customer is going to be extremely important to reassess. Yeah. Uh, VOC, you might have heard of that acronym. Um, that's just one element. Um, is your business still fit for purpose? <clears throat> is it as efficient as it should be? Is it, is it efficient in what it does? Is it adding value still? Is what you're producing still adding value for the customer? These are some of the, the concepts where that Lean Six Sigma tries to get into. Now, John, can, yeah. I, can, can I just, just back up what you've just said there? And I think where businesses may have thought they were efficient previously, they may have to reevaluate and look at their efficiencies again based on current climate and demand. Absolutely. Reevaluate, reevaluate your your business, your, your, your supply chain, your customers, your suppliers, your, exactly. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, so ask the question, what type of boat are you currently sailing in? What is the current state? What is your, what is your current state right now? We, we, this is a, a phrase that's used a lot in uh, Lean Six Sigma, the current state of a business. Yeah, yeah. So reevaluate reevaluate your current state as jimmy says um and see whether it's still gonna work in this new environment this is what type of boat are we in what type of boat are you sailing in um there's many different uh, types of boats just as many different types of businesses there's different business models is your business model still fit for purpose do we need to change our business model I'm, I'm hearing this word purpose, John. Purpose? I'm this word purpose. Yeah. In your mind and in your experience, is the purpose of business to make money or would it have a different purpose? You mm -hmm. mentioned customers earlier. Yeah. How, how does purpose and, you know, the customers, how, how do those two elements come together? Right. Purpose. What is the purpose of, of your business? Is it just to make money? Is money an end product of what you do? Is it the be all and end all of what you do? Um, it is a consequence of adding value to your customers. Yeah. You make money or you are successful and, and a lot of businesses are not out to make money. Care homes, you know, I mean, somewhat, you know, hospitals, Local hospitals. Are you are you there? Um, and do, are you are you meeting the expectations of your customers? Are you adding value to your customers? If you do that, if you keep your eye on the on the prize of, of adding value, then money will follow. Customers will follow. Growth will follow. Okay. Thank you. So it's it's almost as if success in business is an outcome of actually aiming to understand the customer's needs and fulfilling them to the greatest extent possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Fulfilling the needs of your customers, adding value for your customers while of course doing that uh, with um, the lowest cost for your resources. So mm -hmm. you have to be aware. We're not saying do that at any cost. There is the, use of the resources the machinery the people the raw materials the buildings we want to use those resources as efficiently as possible to deliver the value so efficient use of your resources right 
right? Efficient use of resources is, is one part of the equation. Delivering value is the other part of the equation. And those people that can deliver the most value with the least resources are going to be businesses that survive. Okay. Um, so just got a little video here. It's got a few different uh, types of boats. Now, while this video is playing, think about the business that you are in, think about your organization, and think about what sort of boat does it represent. Is it, a, is it an agile, small, fast boat? Is it a large, difficult to navigate boat? Is it an old boat? Is it a new boat? Is it a traditional boat? Is it a modern boat? Is it, right? Just try to use that analogy in your head, that metaphor, and think if your business was a boat, what sort of boat is it? So I'm just going to play the video now while you think about that question. Have we got the sound shared on that video, John? Chris, it must uh, change every time, huh? Yeah. It must change every time. Sorry about that. So uh, you have to do that and then share sound before you do it. So by default, it turns off. There was a little bit of waste, I'm afraid, guys. A little bit of non-value add. Right. Now, this worked last night, didn't it, Chris? Is that better? Well done. Okay, thank you. So, little pause for thought there. Uh, what type of boat is your business? Um, well, we, we, yeah, go ahead, Chris. I mean, initially, I saw a speedboat. Yeah. Very fast moving. Yeah. Probably has a very clear direction. Yeah. As long as it stays on track, it's going to get there very rapidly. But I do ask myself whether that speedboat, if it needs to bank and turn very sharply, whether it may be become unstable. Yeah. I then, saw the, I then saw the riverboat steamer. Yeah, yeah. Traditional. Slow, gets there eventually. Probably built on a lot of traditional values. I then yeah. saw the hovercraft, John. Yeah that was able to bank and turn sharply to change direction, was able to stay above the choppy waters. Yeah. Was able to kind of give a very smooth journey. Yeah, yeah. Although I've been in a hovercraft and it can be very rough at times. It floats above the problems. Exactly, <laughs> floats above the problems. And then I finally saw a cruise ship built for comfort, carrying with it a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. comfortable. Yes, built for comfort. Comfortable, you know, large. So um, are yeah. you saying that we could maybe think of our businesses, the businesses we work in, think of, think of them all of all, also in terms of analogies? Analogies with, with these kind of, with, with, with this video shown as different, different types of craft. Yeah, um, absolutely. In fact, it's not to say that any one of these is better than the other. It's different business models work in different circumstances, different environments, and they work better. It's to make you think, is my boat, is my business model 
is my pro is my process is my system uh still gonna work going to work in this new environment in this new storm with a lower water level and 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 ask those questions okay, okay. so um lean six sigma um lean plus six sigma it's a a collection of principles tools and techniques that have helped been helping businesses for decades um starting uh, in the 1990s and it's had a different focus depending on the environment um just to give you an idea during the um, financial crisis uh there was a lot of interest in lean six sigma for its its cost cutting um low cost uh benefits reducing waste so doing less with more re uh sorry i'll just say reducing waste yeah any any lean class you went to there's a big focus on let's reduce waste let's reduce waste let's reduce waste now that's great and we still have to reduce waste um but with covid 19 we've gone into more of a survival mode um and we need to now use the tools and techniques of six sigma to redesign restructure uh, adapt our processes really look closely are we still fit for purpose so rather than keeping the same processes the same business model and taking the waste out let's take an, a closer look let's do mapping of our processes let's look at the value stream and make sure that it is still adding value for the customer like we thought it was in order to survive we need to do that right so don't know if you've got any questions there i'll just go on to the next slide this phrase it's well, a it's, I've, yeah. I've, i have a question actually i've heard the word agile yeah and agile seems to be very popular at the moment uh, although yeah. i'm not sure that everybody you know i mean the word it has a meaning in shall we say the general english yeah does yeah, it yeah. also have a meaning in terms of the way that we go about solving problems in our businesses you know yes. it just seems a very appropriate word at the moment especially with uh, these changing times yes yes i mean Agile is associated with a, a methodology for running projects, okay. a mindset. It's a, a, you know, for project management, there is, there are agile tools and techniques. Uh, we, 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 it's also associated with scrum, but it's a, uh, a, 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 also a set of, a set of principles for running a business. So there is a, there is a strong, a strong connection between agile and lean six sigma um many of the principles there's a lot of um principles that that interconnect such as root cause analysis such as delivering value uh, in small increments rather than waiting for the large uh, batch of value to be delivered the idea of flow so people who are familiar with agile we're big supporters of agile in the lean six sigma community um also you've heard of scrum type uh projects which deal with you know the team dynamics you know team dynamics are very important team dynamics hmm. so are you saying really that agile and scrum and lean six sigma are all sharing a lot of the same un underlying concepts and principles yes what i'll say chris is that lean six sigma itself is just a name that has evolved okay. over time and we've had different names for these principles tools and techniques over the decades we've had a total quality management right um we've had agile scrum yeah. um, a, a lot of these these uh these concepts have been around for over a hundred years mm -hmm. scientific management Okay. We, we've pulled these together, all the best ones, into a subject called Lean Six Sigma now, um, and that's the current sort of best practice that we we know for these tools and techniques. 
So are you, going, are you going to tell us more about this analogy of the level of the water and what happens if the water line uh, sinks? I, I, I will try to. Let's have a look. What did I just do? Uh, I should have a button for deleting that. Here you go. Um, right. So this, this old English phrase, a rising tide raises all boats. The idea here that is when the water level is high, that your boats uh, are floating above the problems. Yeah. Okay. The economy is strong. Customers want your products. They put up with the inefficiencies. Um, there's enough business to go around for everybody. A growing economy means that the businesses that are in business do well. So these sorts of problems we often can overlook. And this, this complacency builds up in a, in a business. We think, you know, yeah, we're making a lot of money. We don't need to address these problems. Now, what happens when the economy starts to shrink is that what happens in a weak economy? Well, the water level goes down. The cash flow goes down. The cert money circulation goes down. And what happens is that Unfortunately, a lot of businesses go down with it. And these problems that we try to address with Lean Six Sigma um, suddenly become visible. And they become now a problem that is hitting your bottom line. And your cash flow is going to suffer. And you have to stay in business. You have to stay with liquidity. Um, very difficult to do. So what we try to do as an organization is provide the, the training, the consulting, the advice to businesses of how to adapt, redesign, adjust to avoid this situation happening where they're not ready for a reduced economy. Okay, so it's one of the rocks, quality problems, productivity problems, the rework. Yes, rework. So do you want to take that as an example? Yeah. Many businesses have, have work that is being done more than once because it was not done right first time. We get, we get it in, in, uh, in accounting, in banking, we get invoices that have to be done again. We get it in manufacturing where um, a part is not is not worked correctly the first time or 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 connected um, assembled correctly the first time has to come back and be assembled again. Um, this sort of rework may be acceptable or may not impact you so badly in a strong economy, but when you're profit margins are reduced, this rework is going to uh, impact and you're going to go into negative territory. So what, what I'm hearing there, John, is that we should, we should adopt a stronger mindset of refusing to accept rework, refusing to accept doing things twice, even though it may not impact our customers. If we see somebody having to do a job twice to get it right, you're saying, you know, raise our awareness of that to become a, to, to see it when it's happening and then say, well, we're going to cease accepting this. We want to get this right the first time. Exactly. Exactly. We need to be stronger in our, in our re re resolve to um, eliminate rework, to eliminate poor teamwork, to eliminate maintenance issues. Okay. Because these, these are the things that are, are, are no longer going to be uh, able to, we're not going to be able to, um, to keep. Okay. And one major area that is of importance is that the quality of your products and services needs to improve in it needs to improve in a, in a reduced um, economy. It needs to, to improve when the water level goes down because poor quality is actually costing you money. And you are, you are putting up with that for many years during a strong economy. You're not 
concentrating on improving quality. But what does poor quality do? Well, there's the visible costs of poor quality. It's the customer that sends something back or the customer that complains or the customer that, yeah, the customer uh, that is um, going to get a lawyer to sue you. Um, it's, it's having to bring in extra inspectors because there's a complaint. Um, legal fees, fines, warranty payments, um, got, you know, guarantees, sometimes called, you know, the guarantees that you're giving, having to pay out guarantees. These are visible costs of poor quality, which some companies just put up with. And they, they can be as high as 8% of your sales revenue. I mean, that's a ballpark figure. Some companies are going to be, you know, even, even higher. But um, it, it, there have been studies done, and um, some of the studies have been quoting 4 to 8% of your sales revenue can actually be eaten up with this, uh, this, these costs. What about those costs below the waterline, John? Yeah, uh, yeah, just to mention the waterline, yeah. So this iceberg model uh, over here, the idea is that these visible costs are like the top of the iceberg that's showing. And your boat, your boat is actually, you know, having to um, deal with this uh, top of the iceberg. But there's also a below the water, a much bigger part of the iceberg and your boat needs to be aware of this huge amount of waste and costs associated with things like lost customer loyalty customers no longer willing to put up with your poor quality lost sales that customers you might have had um, just never become a customer and um, inventory carrying costs uh, the costs of warehousing the costs of goods that uh, go out of date or uh, deteriorate, um, the cost of, of queues of information that never get dealt with in time. So that is, can be, now that, that's bigger. That can be from 15 to 25% of your sales revenue. Have you read these numbers anywhere, John? Have I? Have you read these numbers anywhere? I mean, you well, know, yeah, one of the great gurus of uh, of Lean Six of Six Sigma and and quality in general, uh, Joseph Duran, did did studies uh, on this sort of thing and, and has published um, figures on on um, the cost of poor quality. So it's sometimes called uh, the cost of poor quality, COPQ, which is um, something we, we we look at in Lean Six Sigma. Well, why do you think organizations focus on the visible costs? Is it precisely because that they're easy to measure, they're easy to quantify, it's easy to focus on something that's uh, quickly measured yeah, rather yeah. than something that's internal, maybe harder to get a handle on, harder to get a grasp of? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's actually a lot to do with traditional accounting. Yeah. Accounting methods. Your accountants, the accountants can, can actually measure things like warranty returns and fines and legal fees mm -hmm. so they will go into your your balance sheet they will go into into the spreadsheets and and uh, and are, are measured so we do focus a lot on the on the what the, is the are the visible costs whereas uh traditional accounting will not be able to put a number on the number of customers that we might have had or the number of customers which do not return for a second purchase. Or indeed the amount of internal rework we've got, which somehow remains hidden because people would rather hide it than get told off. Yeah, there's, there's visible rework and there's invisible rework. Okay. We, we might actually put, put that as visible, but then there's a huge amount of, of hidden rework. Oh. Okay. Hidden. Take us on them, please, John. Yeah, hidden rework. How much hidden rework is there in your company? So, as I said, Lean Six Sigma provides some of the answers to these, these problems and these, um, these challenges that businesses are going to be having uh, now and in the, in the next, next few months. And hopefully, you know, it, it's going to get over, but it can be, be several years before we get over this. So how can Six Sigma provide some of the answers? Well, it, 
it provides uh, tools and techniques and concepts to help you redesign and improve your processes. You know, we teach things like business process management and value stream mapping, process mapping um, to a level that is, is beyond what a lot of people are used to, to really understand are we using our processes in the, in the most efficient way. Okay. It, it helps you to improve the quality of your outputs, actually understand what sort of quality you've got with things like capability analysis of the outputs of your process. Uh, <clears throat> measuring quality in the correct way and looking for root causes of poor quality. So a lot, a lot of uh, tools and techniques of root cause analysis, how teams deal with um, problems with quality and how to um, correctly find solutions. So we provide some frameworks. We provide some frameworks for improving quality. What else? We, we focus on the flow in your organization. Can Better you, flow than on time more, delivery. Go ahead. Can you tell us a little bit more what this word flow means? Mm. I mean, when I heard this word, word flow, is, uh, is this the opposite of start, stop, start, stop? It, it's, well, start, stop, start, stop is, is certainly not flow. Um, flow obviously has got the water analogy coming from the analogy or the metaphor of a river flowing from the mountains down to the sea. Okay. When, a, when, when a river has good flow, it means it doesn't have dams in it. It doesn't have blockages. It doesn't have large pools or lakes where the water suddenly slows down and then, and then speeds up again as it comes out of the lake. So flow is about removing Removing constraints, removing uh, bottlenecks. Exactly, very good. Removing bottlenecks. <sighs> my my writing's just gone to hell. <laughs> removing bottlenecks. Constraints. Bottlenecks plus constraints. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. Bottlenecks and constraints. Um, consistency in the movement of value. So it's about. What is, what is moving from the start of your process to, to the end of the process, which is adding value to the customer? This is why we sometimes call, you, call it a, uh, a value stream. And we want the value to flow. We want the flow of value. What is, what is a value, for example, uh, to a customer of a, in a bank, right? Setting up a new bank account. Well, I want to go quickly. Right? They, they, want, they want their information to go in at one end and be processed. The information they provide has to be processed. So what comes out of the other end is a working bank account. Hmm. Right? Is that, is that flowing smoothly or are there a lot of stoppages, delays, going backwards, asking for new information? Right. Same applies with manufacturing. Are your raw materials coming in at one end? Are they flowing with value being added uh, to the raw materials um, in, in such a way that what comes out the other end is a value added product? OK. And we need to do this with a lower cost, less waste and um, and with really um, lower um, use of resources. Now, resources can be can be raw materials, can be um, people that are on the wrong job. Not we're not talking about getting rid or or um, reducing the number of people. We're saying reallocate people to where they are adding value rather than having them in places where they're not adding value. So lower use of resources, and I'm, I might just put that, or reallocation of resources, right? Of resources. I hate it when people are called resources, you know? I mean, resources are things like power, electricity, um, 
buildings or you know assets i mean people call them assets as well but your 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 buildings your machinery your raw materials these are all resources that are um, need to be fully utilized and you need to have good overall equipment effectiveness for those people watching that are in manufacturing good oee is a concept that we use a lot um, but you, it, people that don't know what OEE is, that, that, that's uh, something we can learn in, in uh, training or just send us an email or, or look it up. Right. One of the issues, John, John, that I've heard of is uh, silo thinking, people being uh, just kind of being sat inside their own departments, just kind of working in isolation from everybody else. Do, do, uh, how, how does what you're telling us link in with this idea of silo thinking, of comp compartmentalization? Yes. Yeah, so I've actually just chosen three very important principles and concepts from Lean Six Sigma, from the whole body of knowledge of Lean Six Sigma, which I think are going to be particularly important at this time of COVID-19, that your businesses really have to get control of. And the first one I've chosen is the fact that cooperation, communication, coordination and collaboration all have to be spot on within your business you need to have these communication cooperation coordination collaboration uh, done very very well and another boat analogy is this one which shows a boat which is your company potentially with one part of the company doing very well and another part of the company that's actually struggling and is potentially going under. So look at your company and think, do we have complete coordination and communication between our different departments, our different what we call silos within the company? And um, even silos that are not part of your company but are stakeholders in your company a stakeholder in your company such as a supplier can if it's if it's having problems if it's not doing its job it will affect your company so you need to look at the whole system of interconnected stakeholders and think this way that all of these things are connected you can't have one part of it doing well, another part doing badly. It all has to work together, be coordinated. So we do not want silo thinking. This is bad. We want systems thinking. We want to be connected. The thinking has to be connected. Okay. And I, I, should I just draw one more diagram for that? So we often think of our processes as by being independent. We have a, a process here which is has inputs and outputs and this is our process and in lean six sigma we often use a little diagram like that inputs and outputs um this output may be an input for another part of your business it usually is right and that has got its own output now so we've got part of your business A, part of your business B. It's not good enough just to focus on process A and not improve process B because the whole system involves A and B. So this is one silo. This is another silo. This might have a manager. This might have a manager. This might have key performance indicators. This might have key performance indicators. And we're working in silos. We've got managers that are only focusing on their silo. But in fact, the, the, the whole business is actually a large system with with many of these individual silos and we have to be focusing on 
what are the KPIs for the whole system? So that's the input to the whole system. This is in, and I'll have to move the move the um, move that over there. No, no, disappeared. I heard you talking about the wastes earlier, John. Yeah. Where are the wastes happening inside this kind of a situation? Right. Very good. So this is this is the 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 output of the whole system. We want to we want to try and break down this silo thinking because I'll just move the this again. A lot of the waste occurs right here, right here. The waste is in the interfaces, okay. the interface between A and B. Is this the handovers, <laughs> the, the handoff the, between the handoff, things? the handoff, the interface, the the transition? Okay. Right. You know, we can't explain this all in five minutes, but there are also interfaces coming from outside. You've actually got interfaces with regulators, interfaces with suppliers, um, and actually the interface with the customer itself is, is important. John, I've heard a lot of talk about innovation. Can you tell us, tell us where this fits into the picture? Yeah. Yeah. So, Innovation, we need to be using technology. There's, there's some fantastic technologies out there that can, that can provide uh, visibility into the whole system for all the silos. So the idea is that we have transparency, visibility, and trust between the silos, and silos are not working separately. So these are concepts that we now um, are, are teaching and uh, coaching in the idea of your business being uh, often too siloed and not enough visibility, not enough transparency, not enough trust between the silos. Okay. Um, the, this, that last part was just the importance of communication, collaboration, coordination. Now, another element that we uh, think is very going to be very important is your problem solving and innovation has to be spot on. We want people to be thinking about new ways to do things, designing things in new ways. So it's, it's developing a mindset within your company and developing the tools and techniques that help with problem solving and innovation. And Lean Six Sigma has many examples of um, improving the mindset, but also tools and techniques for problem solving and tools and techniques for be, uh, helping to be creative, bringing out the creativity in teams. So innovation, um, you know, theory, uh, the theory of practical problem, uh, practical problem solving, um, TRIZ, um, using tools like the house of quality and uh, quality functional deployment. All of these things are part of the Six Sigma, Lean Six Sigma uh, body of knowledge that we, we want to get managers to understand and use. And then just simple stuff like good facilitation and brainstorming sessions. I mean, are people doing good brainstorming sessions? Are you telling me, are you telling me John, that... Uh, uh, we can learn and improve our skills and capabilities in all of these areas, that we can learn this in a structured manner to kind of bring it all together now, to, to kind of, to find a new way to start Very good. forward. You said the word there, structured. Yeah. A structured, a structured framework, right? That's what, that's what Link Six Sigma brings to the table a lot of the time. People are working uh, in a very haphazard, um, non-structured way, towards their their goals their targets and we try to add that um that that structure and, and and framework to it by providing these tools structured tools i mean house of quality is a good example um so i, I promised a third a third area that i think is very important and that is uh flow analysis i did mention flow being removing bottlenecks increasing the flow of value and are you doing that efficiently? You know, are you, are you attempting to remove the bottlenecks? 
Um, this this involves the you know the theory of constraints. That 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 also comes into it, and some people do that as a standalone exercise. But in fact, theory of constraints should be done within the big picture of of lean thinking, systems thinking, and uh, Six Sigma thinking. Theory of constraints, and uh, I know Chris, you you're a big fan of value stream analysis, and you mm -hmm. run workshops, and a typical workshop. I know you try to do it in a, you know, in a two or three hour period, but in fact, people get so involved in it, it can take it can take a full day. Can, can I tell you a very brief story about that, please, John? Yes, sir. I was uh, I was giving I was doing some work in a in in, in a hospital in the UK, and uh, uh, I was I spent some time in the emergency department watching how the work was done there. And uh, the people, uh, the, the people who I uh, commissioned this piece of work for me, they, they said, "So, uh, can you produce a map for us, Chris?" And I said, "Well, I'd rather, I'd rather the people who are actually on on the floor doing the work day in day out produce that map." Well, they haven't got time, so can you do it for us? So very reluctantly, because it was either that or nothing, I put together what we call a value stream map. Yep. And then I said, I'd really like the kind of the teams of the clinicians, the nurses, the support staff. I'd see this map and actually correct it and when these uh, when these people work in the hospital walked into the room and saw this map something magical happened they yep. said no it doesn't work like that they started peeling off these sticky notes off the wall they started rearranging them they were making it their own i could see ownership happening in front of my eyes and i could hear ideas coming up immediately of how to reduce the waiting times of how one person of how a patient could flow from one care area to another i saw that happening in front of my eyes involvement participation of the people who are doing the work each day this is the most incredible tool for getting people on board that I've ever experienced. Very good, Chris. Use your people to do this exercise. Do not bring in a, do, I mean, use a consultant to facilitate it, to maybe help them, but use your workers that know the process best to do this exercise. Don't bring in a consultant to do it and then dump it on them. Uh, have it as an exercise internally. We're going to, we're going to, Finish off real quick yeah, I now. Think it's about wrapping up now. John, yeah, yeah. quick question. Yep. We have an opportunity, uh, you know, over the next couple of months to start learning more about these techniques. Yep. You, know, I've, I, you know, you've told me about the ILSSI org. Do yep. we have an opportunity, a kind of a, yep. an easy way for people to learn more? Yep. Sure, sure. Um, so the last one was experimentation, which I, we, we won't have time to cover, just as we haven't had time to cover many things. But... Um, we're going to move on to um, the the ILSSI uh, conference, which is January the the 13th and 14th, 2021. Uh, we will be doing everything possible to be there in person in Cambridge. We expect to have uh, about 60 people that have uh, signed up to be there in person, including all the speakers. There's only one speaker who's going to be speaking virtually from the USA, and this is a great opportunity to learn more about these these concepts. So uh, it's live streamed for um, for ninety five pounds. You can join the live streaming. Um, you can also come in person if you can make it to Cambridge. Uh, the day ticket, uh, I believe, is three ninety five. Um, but um, yeah, talk to um, talk to Constantin and um, Madalena, Anna in 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 Romania. If you uh, in Romania about these tickets, um, yes. Any, Tell us briefly one or two of the speakers, one or two of the highlight speakers, John. Yeah, yeah, great. I mean, Professor Bob Emiliani, as I say, he's the only person that is uh, going to be only virtual. Um, so he is, he is one of the top thinkers in this space at the moment. He's written uh, dozens of books. Uh, he is very well respected and we were lucky enough to get him for our conference. Um, just as we were lucky to get uh, Professor Gigi Anthony, who is... Um, a bit more on the Six Sigma side, whereas um, Professor Bob is more in the lean side, and um, and then and then we've got uh, a total of 24 speakers. In fact, 24 speakers, and, and some of them are more of like a workshop style. I've only got some of their their fa pretty faces there, uh, but um, yeah, you can you can. It's a great education for 95 pounds. Fantastic education. I've got. Two 
full days there. I've got two full days. I mean, I, I've just got to say this. I think it's an impressive offer. I've got two full days. If I have the opportunity, I can go there in person. If not, I've got two full days of virtual learning opportunities from these world-class problem solvers in Lean Six Sigma. I've got two full days for £95. Is that right, John? That's correct. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, the, we, we have many partners with the ILSSI. ILSSI partners are, are all here. Um, there are opportunities for, for partners. All these partners are involved in the conference, providing some of them providing sponsorship. Um, and we are open for other sponsors and other partners. It's a fantastic community. If any of you would like to um, become a member, um, we, we have good uh, blogs, chat rooms. Um, we all sort of know each other and are always sort of trying to help each other with th these things, problems that you might have. If you're a member of the community, then just reach out to us. Um, and um, we also provide certifications. A lot of people require certifications for their professional development. If you're looking for a new job or a promotion within your job, there are uh, certifications to be had within uh, accredited by ISI. And I just want to say thank you to everyone for listening. Um, and I hope to, that we can take some questions now. Uh, and I think there's some somewhere in the chat, Chris. Yes. Uh, uh, I'll stop sharing now. So the, the first opportunity uh, you've mentioned, I mean, learning. I think as much as anything, given that uh, some businesses have uh, have a little bit of, well, there's not so much business coming through the door. There is there is time. There is an opportunity to get some learning on Lean Six Sigma. I mean, you know, is this an expensive learning program to learn more about Lean Six Sigma, John? No, I mean, there's there's various there's various ways you can do it online. Self self study. I mean, I would encourage anybody just to to buy some good books initially to get interested in it. But uh, there's nothing there's nothing quite like a good classroom trainer uh, that really motivates you and really makes you think. So I would encourage the classroom training if you have the time and, and the money, you know, it, it, they, they run from around about um, uh, 1,500 euros a week um, would, would get you in a class somewhere mm -hmm. or, or group bookings for less than that. I just want to, can I just look at um, some of these questions here? Yeah. Somebody uh, starting. Good morning. Good morning. Um, One of the questions we have, John, is it's from Michael, actually. Yeah. Uh, he says he heard from the U.S. Treasury, the Inland Revenue Service in Hong Kong, that uh, uh, a kind of a reset, a recovery is likely to occur in the U Europe and the U.S. in spring 2021. Mm. And also the impact of Brexit. I mean, mm. how is all of this tying in with, with what we've been talking about today? Yeah. Well, uh, depending on what country you're in and which politician you're speaking to, some are going to want to be extremely positive and talk about a V-shaped recovery. And then, um, and, and then others are, are far more negative and, and see it lasting uh, several years. So the truth is somewhere in the middle, I believe. And I, I do not think uh, there'll be a recovery by spring 2021. Do you know what? But I, yeah. If I can say, if I can say this, I detect a lot of desire out there for things to go back to normal. I, I no longer know what the word normal means, mm. and it's almost as if people, you know, some people might be thinking, well, if I just hold tight and do nothing, it's going to go back to the way it was before. I think the tenor of your message is, hey, adapt innovate, move forward, make something new for ourselves rather than waiting for it to go back to the way it was before. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. There's some interesting comments about the boats. So some people think uh, uh, the hovercraft uh, uh, designed for coastal navigation only. <laughs> um, uh, and um, some people think that their business is a bit like the, uh, the small speedboat. Yeah. John, um, I'd, I'd like to ask if there's any questions out in the room yeah. from the people who have kind of uh, at least joined in Zoom. They could unmute their microphone and ask any questions out loud. Is there anybody who would like to ask a question out loud, please? Simply unmute your microphone. The floor is yours.
I want to know there's life out there. Come on, please. One of the questions from the chat session was from Servan, actually. He says, training people to adapt to change can be difficult because of human resistance. Mm. What, what are your thoughts on that, John? Mm. Chris, just to say we have 96 people watching us on Facebook. So yes. there are also... But do we have any questions from Facebook? Yeah. Uh, no questions on Facebook at the moment. So if you're on Facebook, please put your question in and yeah. our team will see your question and pass it on. Yeah, yes, yeah. please. So, Chris, the answer to your question is um, uh, being in a, innovative and coming up with good ideas is only is, is less than half the battle. Um, we, we provide the tools and techniques for that innovative thinking, thinking out the box, of course, lateral thinking. But um, it's 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 a small part of the total change. You can come up with a great idea, but to actually implement it and go through the change process needs um, fantastic change management. And you change management is one of the biggest uh, issues that businesses are going to face in the next year. The resistance to change, the, uh, the, the feeling, the uh, uncomfortable feeling people have when their process, their job requirement changes. And it takes great management to do that. So I encourage people to um, to you know, study the philosophy behind change management. Books like Cotter um, is very good. Uh, C O T T E R. Um, do, we, do we have an opportunity to learn more about change management at the ILSSI conference? Do we actually, have a we have a, we actually somebody that's on the talk right now. Uh, Cola. I don't know if you can see Cola. All to me, me is uh, actually going to give a talk on change management. Yes. Okay, so that's another so, opportunity. Yeah, yeah. And while we're waiting for people to pluck up their bravery now, I'm just going to just raise a very quick question. Uh, Please, Cola. Just, just something that I'm asking. This has been a very fantastic uh, presentation, by the way, and I like the combination. And I just wanted to, John to also just say some of the things that you do get out of the fact that you've got your processes working better. And I'd just like you to just say something about Shig. Shingel, uh, uh, Shigel Shingi on the easier, uh, oh, yeah, 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 easier, yeah, yeah, better, yeah, yeah. faster people. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if you want to, one takeaway from this talk uh, that, that you can um, sort of write on the wall or spray paint on the wall, uh, a great, a great uh, guru in, in process improvement in the 20th century called Shigio Shingo. He put it like this. He said, the, pro the, the purpose of process improvement is to make your processes easier, better, faster, and cheaper. In that order, he said, the first thing you do is make your processes easier for the workers in that process, less frustrating, less rework, um, better communications. Better quality, so easier, better quality, faster, meaning better flow, better delivery. And then what will happen is you'll find your costs will go down. But you'll also have better, uh, adding more value, more delighted customers and more delighted uh, employees as well. So easier, better, faster, cheaper is a, is a nice takeaway. And Shigio Shingo uh, made that very clear. Thank you, Cola. John, I've got a question from the chat room. Thanks, Carl. I've got a question from the chat room from Christina. She's, she's asking, which is the first step for improvement? What's the first step? Is mm -hmm. it, is, is understand, first... Understand, your, understand your current state. Understand your problem. How are Define we your that? problem. I mean, how are we going to do that? I mean, do we do that in meetings or do we need to get out there and literally watch how the work is being done? And kind of rub, rub, rub elbows wherever possible with the people who are actually doing the doing the job each day. Absolutely, absolutely. That's what that's what you need to do. You need to 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 observe visually observe what is actually going on, and and actually talk to your customers, get feedback from your customers. So the two things, you know, focus groups with your customers, surveys from your customers, uh, you know, data mining. 
of customer behavior? Has it changed? But also internal to your processes, your workers. Talk to your workers. Watch your workers. So in other words, the starting point is watch and listen. Watch and listen. That, that, yeah. would, that would sum it up. Yeah. I have heard the expression, go look. Go look, see, ask why. I, I, I don't know whether I remembered that properly, John. I think that's right. Another question from Amar. Amar asks, uh, to understand the process, what is the best technique that can be used to improve supply of materials given the, the impact, the, the effects of COVID? Mm. I well, mean, that, that's a big question, John. Yeah. If you've he's got get, he's answer, getting to the, be a very good man. Yeah, what, what, what was the name there? From Amar. Amar, yeah. Amar, Amar might be getting to uh, the, the, trying to understand the point about um, are we still going to be able to use just-in-time processes um, or will we have to carry more inventory yeah. um, in order to um, keep keep our businesses running as supply chains potentially get disrupted. And, um, you know, this, this, this just in time is a misnomer. misnomer. It, 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 it gives the wrong impression. Um, businesses have really, very few businesses have, have worked in a pure just in time um, mm -hmm. way. There's always been some inventory necessary, but what we say is you, you, Observe your processes, observe your, measure, measure your inventory levels, measure your throughput, measure your demand, and you come up with the right levels of inventory to keep. And uh, good forecasting using statistics is, is part of it. But yeah, it's, it's a, that's one problem that we want to help you to solve. What are the correct inventory levels you should be keeping? Can I share some thoughts I've had, I have on that one, please? How much time do we have? I don't know. Well, uh, I'm, I'm hoping uh, Neil, Neil was give, will give us an indication. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I just, yeah. yeah. I think while we have people still watching, I think we can keep going. <laughs> Would that be correct? That's yeah. a good. That's a good way to do it. Yeah. Something I once learned is never walk away until the, until they throw me out of the front door. <laughs> I can see lots of chats as well. I'm sure yes. you've seen those. Yes. Yeah, so. I just want to uh, aim to add a little bit from my experiences of watching the COVID-19 situation. The government, in, 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 a very, in a very praiseworthy desire to kind of solve the situation, was putting out their huge, you know, purchases of, uh, purchasing millions of, you know, huge deliveries of millions of gowns and face masks from, from uh, shall, shall we say, suppliers from far afield from the far east kind of waiting for you know transport planes to bring in a million gowns a million face masks and I'm, I'm certainly looking at more harnessing the abilities and the knowledge and the know-how of the local hospitals about having the local economy stepping in and filling those gaps and actually you know creating a local supply chain to deal with the lack of personal protective equipment so what one of the one of the messages I've been pushing in, in conversations I've participated in is actually to solve a problem. Start by thinking small, thinking about local supply, localize the decision making, give your own people the ability to source directly instead of waiting for centralized government departments to make decisions that can sometimes take weeks or months. And then the delivery fails and we have another three to six month delay in getting in the supplies make it some, a big problem can be solved by breaking it down into smaller chunks. You've heard the expression, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Yeah, how do you supply masks? 50 masks at a time, 100 masks at a time. Clearly hospitals demand levels are higher, but create a steady stream of supplies rather than waiting for six months for that huge gigantic delivery that's gonna solve the world, except it doesn't because it gets delayed another three months. That's certainly the experiences I've gained from, from kind of watching the past six to nine months and how we've tackled the PPE problem. Yeah. Uh, I have another question from Jimmy, actually. Jimmy, I think we, 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 uh, we saw Jimmy earlier on. Jimmy Forster saying, uh, we talk a lot about manufacturing businesses. How does Lean Six Sigma assist in the service sectors and, and in office environments? Do you have any thoughts about that one, John? Um, how, how is it applying in office environments? Oh, it, it's, it's completely um, over the last uh, decade, you know, transitioned from being very much a manufacturing focused methodology 
into um, being very important in, in services and transactional businesses. So there are many examples of, of banks, um, insurance companies, uh, retail, commercial uh, companies, uh, food, food and beverage that are using Lean Six Sigma and have green belts and black belts that have important roles in their in their businesses. So where where we think of um, in manufacturing, the flow being of a product, a hard product like a raw material or a part or a, 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 a in, in services, it is often the flow of either people that we're talking about. So in hospitals, people moving through the process or in, in airports, people moving through the process in the travel industry, Lean Six Sigma, very applicable in travel industry, which is going through a terrible time right now. Um, or the, the movement of data. Think about law, law firms um, that have, have used Lean Six Sigma very effectively. Uh, uh, I believe Jimmy Foster, uh, Brian Butler has spent many months helping a Scottish law firm streamline their processes using mm -hmm. lean principles and techniques. Um, so what is it in, in the law firm that's moving? It's, it's information. It's mainly the movement of information backwards and forwards. And you want the information and the, uh, the data to move efficiently. One of, well, the, uh, one of the most striking examples of, of lean being used in, in an office environment, I've, I've based a whole series of activities around it. Yeah. I've got a value stream mapping workshop based around it. I saw that an organization, it had a large number of retail outlets dotted across the whole of the country. And uh, it was taking, it was taking sometimes a month to three months to get an issue with one of the retail outlets sorted, you know, a leaking roof, uh, uh, the, 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 the damage to the alarm, something like that. It was taking three months. So the, the, the team mapped the process and found out that they needed to get three quotes in order to kind of contact a supplier and get, get the piece of work done. Even if it was a very minor piece of work that maybe just cost a few hundred pounds to, to, to get something fixed. And I think it, only once they mapped it from beginning to end in this kind of administrative process, they realized they had a real, a massive gigantic opportunity to reduce this three month timeline to, you know, almost literally getting the repair done that very same week by empowering the, 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 the kind of the, uh, shall we say that the team leaders to make decisions themselves. Clearly, if it's going to be huge, massive expenditure, you're going to need more checks and balances. But there was a one size fits all process. Everybody had to go through three quotes. And I just saw lean applied in that situation. And, and it was incredibly eye opening and empowering for everybody involved. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Um, now, I suspect there's quite a few people because this is the British Romanian Chamber of Commerce event. Thank you, uh, uh, BRCC, for putting this on. Yes. Um, there probably is a large proportion of people that are based in Romania because they probably saw the communication a little bit more than other countries. Um, we do have a, a, a partner that's based in Romania, um, which is called Enviso, and their, their, their CEO is on the call right now, uh, Constantin Stan. So um, oh. we, we have local presence uh, for people that want local trainers in, or in Romanian um, Constantin, uh, you're based in Bucharest, uh, I believe. Right. And you, are you still putting on any classroom classes at the moment, training? Yes, actually, we have uh, in-house classes for specific customers, but uh, also open classes. And all of them are posted on our websites. So uh, everyone interested can uh, take a look and uh, can still enroll. Yeah. TV Do we have any other uh, tr training organizations in Lean Six Sigma on the call that um, uh, are, uh, are, are going to help, you know, can help um, educate people in business in Lean Six Sigma? Does anybody uh, want to speak up who's that I, I'm not familiar with? I, I know Jimmy Foster is a, is a trainer and coach. Um, Cola is a trainer and coach. We have plenty from Invisos. Anybody I'm, I'm, um, that I'm missing there? Or, or are the rest of the people mainly working in, uh, in either service or manufacturing business, potentially? 
No. I know one other people here, Amar. I don't know whether Amar wants to voice some of your experiences, Amar, if you're still listening in, some of the challenges that, uh, that, that organisations you know are currently mm -hmm. going through. Uh, I know I've, I've just kind of directed that question on one individual yeah. person. Yeah, yeah. Do we, no. so do we have any more questions? Any more questions from the room? Or has John actually just flooded you with fantastic information and you all need time to absorb it? Hello, Chris. Hi, everyone. Hi, uh, thank you for your brief presentation. Thank you. Actually, I, I can deliver a lot of training if you want. Uh, I can join your conference as well. Uh, I delivered a lot of uh, cost of quality, uh, value stream mapping, uh, the make system as well. Great. Uh, root cause analysis, uh, AT. Great. So much Thank training. You. Thank yeah. you. We, what we are your experiences, Amar? I'm, I'm going to ask you again, Amar. What are your experiences for helping uh, overcome uh, the fears and the concerns and the resistance of the teams that you've worked with? Yeah, I actually started with uh, training people, uh, educate them uh, through the posters, electronic posters, uh, coaching them. Yeah. and then let them work as a team uh, rather than just uh, apply the process by myself. No, just create a team and uh, let them work, let them think together uh, and then uh, take the problems with the do root cause analysis together, fish bone, using fish bones, mm -hmm. uh, gun chart mm -hmm. and pre to chart as well. Uh, and then uh, after that, you know, like a brain, do like a small session of brainstorming. Uh, first, go together in the shop floor, find the uh, eight type of waste. And then from eight type of waste, uh, identify the problems. Uh, and then start with one, uh, each of these uh, eight type of waste. And then after that, uh, identify the root cause analysis, uh, find the root cause of these problems, and then pray to chart to find which one is impact more. And then uh, take the problems and then find out what uh, the solution can be applied for that. And then uh, again, pre to chart for the best solution can be applied. And then after that, I'll implement the solution, check if the solutions work. If it's work, okay. If it's not work, you need to go back and check the root causes. This is one of the training I, I was doing there uh, in, the, in the last, uh, in my previous job uh, called Gimba Walk. Yeah, very good. Th th yeah. Thank you, uh, Amar. As, as you can see, there, there are a lot of people out there that, um, you know, have some experience of, of these, these concepts and tools and techniques. So we, we really recommend the people that are um, working in these businesses that are having these challenges to reach out to somebody. Uh, and ILSSI is one source, but there's many other sources. So right. please... Try to try to educate yourselves in some of these uh, concepts and tools and techniques, and uh, try to ride this storm. And uh, please do not crash on the rocks. Please do not crash on the rocks. Yeah, of course. <laughs> what I am going to ask people to do, John, is crash into our website and learn how to uh, in, uh, crash into the ILSSI org website and learn how to. Uh, learn how they can uh, visit the conference in January and uh, take advantage of that amazing offer. Yeah, so, uh, well, the, the, the URL is above my head here, ilssi.org. So, uh, yeah, we, we, we're a great community and we'd love to have you. We'd love to meet you, talk oh, to you, great. and yeah, be, be part great. of the community. So, Amar, I've got your, your name and number, so we're looking out for you. That's good, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's Can you good. Please thing. post the link to your website, Chris, in the chat box for everyone. I have already done so, and I will do so again, Neil. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Yeah. Neil, would you like just to um, make a closing comment, or Chris, make a closing comment? I think I'm going to leave it for Neil, actually. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think this has been an extremely interesting uh, webinar. Thank you all very much indeed. Um, I think this is shown by the interest we've had on Facebook Live and also the, with the number of questions we've had here. As you say, um, we're in a storm and your title for Get On Board or Sink is extremely appropriate. I would say, um, as someone who works in an information business of the kind you described, even having come from Scotland in the first place, that what you say is extremely appropriate in whatever it is you're doing, don't assume that there's not a better way of doing it. 
that the way that it worked a year ago or five years ago or even um, five months ago is not necessarily the way that works now. So having had the experience of today of being kicked out of the meeting or the webinar by a webinar by a, an internet problem, uh, this will be available uh, as a recording for those who want to see it again. Uh, at least one new member contacted me in the course of the, the, uh, this, this webinar. Uh, this clash with another event, he couldn't see, he couldn't go, but he wants to see it as a recording. So this again is adding value to all of you as our members or potential members if you aren't yet members, because we're here to grow business and sustain business. And I can't think of a better way than by working with companies on institutions like Lean Six Sigma. Um, Constantin, thank you very much for setting this up with your colleagues in the UK. Thank you so much. Um, thank, thank you, you. Constantin. I look forward to the next seeing you again on this one. Um, thank you to Madalena, Stefan and Anna, our colleagues in the chamber for organizing this. It's done a, done a cracking job as usual. Thank you. Um, Anna, when is our next webinar, please? Uh, thank you, Neil. Uh, thank you, John and Chris for uh, delivering this very informative presentation today. And as you said, John, at the beginning, we are living in challenging times. And of course, this uh, doesn't allow us to have face-to-face -face events. However, we stay active in the online. As you can see, we are having uh, every week another webinar on different topics. And next week, we're going to have a very interesting webinar on sustainability together with our member from London Stock Exchange. And in two weeks time, we're going to have a case study webinar on doing business in Romania. Uh, as I can see, the chat has been very active today. So I'm also going to type in uh, our website link so you can uh, be up to date with our events and webinars. And thank you again for being here and please stay safe and take care of yourselves. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest thank of the you day. so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.